Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, second lecture of our March Madness series. Uh, this lecture is titled Telehealth COVID-19 and the Older Adult. Um, good afternoon. My name is Martha Holland. I'm the interim project manager for the Seniors Agenda of Santa Clara County. Seniors Agenda has been hosting a series of meetings every first Thursday of the month since September of last year. And these meetings focus on bridging the digital, digital divide for older adults in Santa Clara County. We have a group of approximately 40 professionals from various agencies throughout our county um, that have been actively working on projects, proposals, and programs to address digital inclusivity and mitigate social isolation. The lecture that you will hear today is the second of three lectures in this month. Um, and this lecture today will be focusing on like I mentioned, telehealth COVID-19 and the older adult. Um, we also have another lecture at the end of the month and we'll talk about that at the end of today's event um, where you can go register on Eventbrite. But now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Jose Covarrubias. Josue is a state and nationally certified recreation therapist and has been working with older adults and individuals with disabilities for the past 13 years. Previously, he was the executive director for a memory care assisted living center in Seattle, Washington. And in 2016, he moved to San Jose to work for the city as an inclusion specialist, supporting individuals in accessing city programs and services. Currently, he's the recreation supervisor overseeing senior services for the city of San Jose's parks and recreation neighborhood services department. He's an avid gardener and a proud cat dad. Josue is a member of our digital inclusion work group and has played an important role in our meetings as an advocate and someone committed to providing services to our older adult population. I would like to thank Josue for volunteering to moderate today's event and would also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend today's lecture. Just as a reminder, this lecture will be recorded and it will be made available on our various online platforms. I will now hand this over to Josue who will go over a couple of housekeeping items and will introduce today's presenter. Go ahead, Josue. Hi, thank you, Martha, for the introduction. I'll be your uh, moderator for today. I wanna thank all of you for uh, coming on and listening to this lecture series. So uh, this is gonna be a webinar feature, so, um, if you do have questions, please use the question and answer feature that's on the bottom of your screen. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, but as you think of questions or comments, go ahead and post them on the Q&A, um, and that way, you know, they're fresh on the top of your, on your mind. So um, with that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Mei Kwong has over two decades of experience in state and federal policy work. She is the executive director Center for Connected Health Policy, the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. She has written numerous policy briefs, crafted state legislation, and led several coalitions efforts on a variety of issues and assisted states in their telehealth efforts, particularly in Medicaid and public health. Ms. Kwong is recognized as a national expert on the telehealth policy. She helped create the model statute language that became the basis for the 2011 California State legislation that updated California telehealth law, published several articles on telehealth and telehealth policy and various peer reviewed journals and is the co-author of CCHP's 50 state Medicaid telehealth reimbursement survey. She has been consulted by state and federal lawmakers on telehealth legislation and policy and is sought out by the media to provide insight on telehealth issues. Ms. Kwong is a sought after speaker who has spoken to a variety of audience, including health industry executives, physicians, journalists, and various national organizations. Prior to joining CCHP, Ms. Kwong was a policy analyst for the Children's Home Society of California, where she worked on education and early childhood issues. She, has she was recognized for her work by the Child Development Policy Institute. Ms. Kwong, is a graduate of George Washington University Law School and has a BA in International Affairs. Uh, welcome, Ms. Kwong. We are very happy to have you with us. Thank you, Jose, and reminder to myself <laughs> to send the shorter bio <laughs> for these things. So thank you for reading that. That was very kind of you. 
So as Jose mentioned, my name is Meg Huang. I'm the executive director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. And before we begin, I also have to put some disclaimers out. So any information that I provide for today's talk should not be considered a legal device. It is strictly for informational purposes. CCHP always recommends that if you're interested in a formal legal opinion to please seek out legal counsel. And also if I happen to mention um, a company or show some type of product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of relationship or affiliation with such a company. A little bit of background about CCHP. We were actually established in 2009 as a California telehealth policy organization. We're a program underneath the Public Health Institute, but an opportunity to become the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center became available in 2012 through a grant program underneath HRSA with the federal government. CCHP applied for that, we got the grant, and we've been serving that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other funders and partners on the state and federal level on more specific telehealth projects. We're also the administrator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And we're the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. So the California Telehealth Policy Coalition is a coalition of over 100 statewide groups and individuals who are interested in advancing telehealth policy within the state. We meet on a monthly basis and CHP essentially staffs this group. So we look at what policies to support as it's going through the legislative process, what education materials we can put out as well. So if anyone's interested in that, you can reach out to me and I can provide you with a little bit more information. So, I mentioned sorry to interrupt Ms. Yeah. We're going to be go, launching a quick little poll before we uh, go further into the, the lecture. We want to get an idea of where our agencies uh, are being represented today. Um, so Sonia, if you could launch that quick poll for us. So the poll is what agencies are represented here today? Uh, the options are community-based organization, government entity, community member, advocate, business, or other. So the results are in, and it looks like the uh, majority of the participants today are a government entity making up 61% of the group uh, second to that is community-based organizations. We love our nonprofits, followed by other. I'm not sure what that would be exactly. And uh, we also have uh, advocates and community members both at 4%. No businesses here for today. Um, we can maybe launch the second poll um, now. So the question for the second poll is, uh, have I or a family member has utilized telehealth? Oh. Look at that. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a good breakup. It's look, 62% have either utilized telehealth or a family member of theirs has and 38 percent still pretty large group have not had the opportunity to take advantage of that okay thank you jose for doing that so that was actually a very interesting result and we'll, i'll talk a little bit more about that when i find that interesting but just really quickly i said i would explain what the national consortium of telehealth resource centers are so I mentioned that CCHP was fed, funded by the federal government underneath a program called the Telehealth Resource Centers. And what those are, there are 14 different grantees underneath that program. CCHP is the one on policy. There are 12 that are regional resource centers and they cover specific states. And their charge is to provide technical assistance to people who have questions regarding telehealth, usually if they're trying to start a telehealth program. So say you're a clinic, you're interested in launching a telehealth program, but you're not quite sure where to get started, you can reach out to your telehealth resource centers and they will provide you with that technical assistance of like, how do you work through the initial questions? What do you look at um, when you're trying to like figure out what technology you're doing? We want to use, um, you know, what you, should you consider for like billing and reimbursement purposes, etc. So because we are all federally funded, 
really the majority of our services that technical assistance is free. Now, if, if, if there's like a lot of in-depth you know, work that you need or you want or something, there may be talk about doing a bit of a, a small contract with the telehealth resource centers, but for the most part, the services that the telehealth resource centers offer are free. Um, when these regional telehealth resource centers run into a policy question or a technology question that they can't answer, they elevate it to the national centers. The policy questions come to CCHP and then the technology questions go to the National Technology Resource Center, which is based out of Alaska. California has its own regional telehealth resource center. It's called the California Telehealth Resource Center, not the most imaginative name, but it explains what it is. But we all work very collaboratively together under this umbrella called the National Consortium. So this was actually something the 14 of us decided to form because um, there were sort of overlapping questions that we were getting, common things that each regionals were, were running into that we thought, hey, let's just make the best use of our resources and like collaborate on this so we're not duplicating efforts or, and wasting resources that way. Hence the National Consortium, and they selected CCHP to administer that consortium for them. So I really encourage you if you have like telehealth questions to really start with your resource center if you have them. And, and I would say like 99% of the time, somebody at the resource center can like answer that for you um, before you start looking at, you know, if you're interested in hiring a consultant or something like that, just start with the telehealth resource center first because most of those services are free. And also we're all really experienced in telehealth. So that's the also the good thing is that you have like an experienced person trying to answer your question. So the poll I said was really interesting because if we had taken that poll before COVID-19 pre-pandemic, I think those numbers would have been tilted more towards had not used telehealth before, um, either me or a family member. That would probably would have been flipped in some way and probably had a higher no number of the no's. Because of the pandemic, telehealth obviously has like really been elevated. It's really become you know, more enmeshed in like an everyday person who's not involved in healthcare's vocabulary and in their world, because most likely they or somebody they know may have had a telehealth interaction during the past year. Now, it was still kind of interesting that the numbers were as high as they were for never had done it before, but it was definitely uh, something that was quite different than what you would have seen before the pandemic hit. Before we jump into it, I just want to go over some terminology because I, I am guilty of this. I'll just start slipping into terminology. And for those who aren't familiar with telehealth, they may get a little confused and not understand what I'm saying because they're not as used to it as I am. It's just second nature for me. So when we talk about telehealth, we're really talking about us utilizing technology to provide some sort of health service from a distance where the two parties are not in the same location. And when you're talking about two parties, usually it's a patient and like their provider, like a doctor or a nurse, but it could also be between two providers as well. Sometimes you'll hear telemedicine used instead of telehealth and people will ask, well, what's the difference? It, it's really used interchangeably, but it can vary from like state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, because everybody uses like their own preference for a term. They may use telehealth, they may use telemedicine, they have different definitions for them. But sort of the more common term is telehealth, though you'll still run across telemedicine as well. Sort of rule of thumb, telemedicine is kind of a subset underneath the larger umbrella of telehealth. Telemedicine is direct health care services, whereas telehealth is more encompassing. It could be something like health education, could be patient um, uh, care coordination and other things as well that don't necessarily fall underneath telemedicine. So an example of like, you know, telehealth and what exactly it means, I have on here the California definition that's actually in statute. And Jose had mentioned that I worked on the model statute um, back in 2011. That is actually where this definition came from, is that model statute that CCHP had created. So each state for the most part, most of the states have some sort of definition for the term telehealth or telemedicine, and whatever they may be using. And it could be in their state law or it could just be in their Medicaid program. It varies depending on where you find it. California happens to have one in state law. There's also four what we call modalities, really four sort of types of technology in which you deliver the services underneath telehealth. You have something called synchronous or live video. And that what that means is, is that it's taking place in real time. So it's a real time interaction between the two parties. So like right now, this would be considered a live video or a synchronous interaction if we were doing some sort of health interaction. 
Then you have something called storm forward or maybe called asynchronous. And that means it doesn't take place in real time. So it's the capture of information, you're storing it and then you're forwarding it to somebody. So for example, think of, oh, I've got a skin condition, a rash. I'm just not sure what it is. I go to my primary care doctor she's not certain what it is. She takes a picture of it and she sends it to a dermatologist. She's like captured the information, she stored it and she's forwarding it to a dermatologist. That dermatologist is not sitting right there at that exact moment when that picture is coming in to like provide a diagnosis and to like engage with my primary care provider or with me. The dermatologist is probably gonna look at it a later time, later that day, you know, the next day or whatever. So it's been captured and forwarded and it's not taking place in real time. And then the dermatologist will get back to like my primary care provider and say like, you know, it's this, do X, Y, and Z. Then you have something called remote patient monitoring. And this is continuous monitoring of a patient for a particular thing. So it could be um, in real time or it can be not in real time. So a real time example can be in an ICU unit. So your intensivist may not be on site with the patient. Maybe they're in a different location, but they are monitoring things in real time and they're directing healthcare staff, healthcare personnel who are physically there with the patient to do whatever. A non-real-time example could be a patient who has hypertension, say. They're at home, they're taking blood pressure readings several times a day, and they're transmitting them to their healthcare provider. Healthcare provider, again, it's probably not looking at them as those transmissions are coming through. They're probably looking at them at the end of the day, maybe at the end of the week, and then like, you know, doing what they need to do, contacting the patient, <clears throat> et cetera, going, you know, whatever their next steps need to do. So that's like a remote monitoring can take place in real time or can take place not in real time. And then you have mHealth. mHealth is really just all the other three uh, encompassed or like delivered through some sort of mobile application. So, or mobile device such as an iPad or a smartphone or a laptop or something. And it's usually through an app. So it's kind of uh, just sort of like, it's all the others, but it's just using this different type of device in which to deliver that service. So those are kind of like your basic terminologies, your basic, what we call modalities or ways of delivering care underneath the big umbrella of telehealth. So why telehealth for older adults? Why, why is this important? Why can it be beneficial for them? So there's a lot of light of you know benefits to this. One of the beauties of telehealth is that it can provide the care where the patient's located. So you're not requiring them to like travel to a doctor's office, to a hospital, perhaps because you know it's a great distance, it would be very like burdensome on them to do the traveling. So you can like provide it to them where they are there and you reduce the travel time. It increases access to specialists. One of the big reasons telehealth has been used in the past, it's been used in like, for example, rural areas or underserved areas where there may not be specialists there um, because there may not be like basically enough people who would need that particular specialist's care. So they, they don't move to like this rural area. So, but the, obviously there's still people there who might need that type of specialist. So instead of having them travel, maybe they can use telehealth to like engage with that specialist as well. So they wouldn't have to travel or they wouldn't have to go without care. It's also been shown, and these are studies that have shown that it's helped with the chronic conditions. Going back to my hypertension example, there's actually a lot of published studies to show that telehealth, when you do that remote patient monitoring, it's helped reduce hospitalizations because you're capturing those incidences with these chronic conditions before they deteriorate to the point where they need to be in the emergency room. So the hypertension example is like capturing that high blood pressure readings and getting that blood pressure under control before somebody strokes, strokes out, or um, when somebody has congestive heart failure, you know, running that interference where the warning signs are coming of like somebody might be getting close to that congestive heart failure because there's just a sudden weight gain, you know, addressing that before it gets to like a more serious problem. It allows for better care coordination in some cases in that you have everything, um, you have like various providers who can like engage with each other, sort of like what we're doing now over, you know, um, multiple uh, platform where you have multiple providers engaging and coordinating the care of a patient. And it keeps other family members in the loop. Sometimes you have family members who are not close by to like an 
their parents or their grandparents, but they want to be kept in the loop on their information. You can like video them in with them or have them join, like again, sort of like what we see in Zoom, multiple people joining in on that particular um, healthcare interaction so they can be aware of what's going on with like their loved ones. Now, not to say that there aren't any cons. So if you talk to anybody who is a telehealth proponent, they will say like telehealth is not appropriate for every single situation. And there are also some, some drawbacks to that or some issues that seniors may run into. One of them is you need like that connectivity for telehealth to work. If it can't connect, then telehealth is not gonna work. So not all seniors may have access to like that connectivity or they may not have access to the necessary technology. When COVID started, I, um, my parents are seniors. They also have limited digital literacy. They have like limited ability to work with technology. Um, and their doctors moved them over to telehealth for like their routine visits. My parents would not have been able to do that unless, um, you know, I was not there to help facilitate all that because we use like all of my, like my computer, my equipment, I set them up. I like, you know, help them with, with the whole sort of interaction, like, you know, dialing up and so forth to get connected. They, didn't, they would not have been able to do that on their own. We have seniors who may be in the same situation because they may not have the technology and also they may not have the digital literacy to understand how to do that. It can be confusing and complicated sometimes for some people. And you know, for, for a lot of people, if you can't get it to work, you just get frustrated and you don't wanna go back to it. So that can also be an issue. And as I said earlier, it may not be appropriate for every case. Like I am a great proponent of telehealth, but I do not, I do not say it is appropriate for every single situation. It's not. There's going to be times where you still need to see somebody in person. So, you know, it's not going to solve everything. It can address some things, but there will still be times where telehealth should not be used for certain situations. And then there's existing policy barriers that limit its use. And that's really what we're going to focus in on today a lot is are the policy barriers that exist. Now, these are in, in some cases, like artificial barriers that policymakers have put up for whatever reason, some of them are old and just lingering around. They've just never been addressed. And they've, they've like really kind of not kept pace with the evolution of the technology. So they're like, they, they're there, they still exist, but they were crafted for a situation maybe two or three, two or three decades ago. And if you think back to like where the technology was back then, maybe it made sense then, but doesn't quite make sense now. So these are things that kind of like, you know, impede the use of telehealth, but also are like, you know, the drawbacks of using telehealth as well. Fast forward to COVID-19, what happened last year, almost like exactly like a year, I think it's been a year now. Um, and it's really changed everything. It was, it's a highly infectious disease. Uh, seniors and older adults were especially vulnerable to it. So there were people who just really needed to like limit their contact with, with others, their exposure to it. Healthcare industry changed dramatically. They had to really pivot towards the use of telehealth. You know, thankfully telehealth was there to not be the solution for everything, but it was definitely a tool that was needed during this time because its special features were, were great for this particular situation. It can provide healthcare services, but it can still maintain distances between people, which was very valuable when you have like a highly infectious disease out there. So the policy landscape, I talked about earlier that there were barriers to the use of telehealth and that you know the utilization of it, when we did the poll, if we had asked a question pre-pandemic, it probably would have been flipped and probably the numbers would have been higher for never used it before. A lot of that, again, had to do with the policy barriers that existed. This is your 100,000 level foot view of like the policy changes that took place for telehealth during COVID-19, both on the federal level and on the state level. Not a lot of details, but I, I have this up here to, so you can see like there were like at least like a lot of common areas in where they, they made policy changes or like address certain policy issues, such as like, you know, what services would be eligible to be covered, like the location of where the telehealth interaction took place, the type of providers could provide the services. You see those are common issues that were addressed both on the state and the federal level. And, and the reason for that was 
a lot of those issues were related to coverage and reimbursement. What can you do via telehealth and what can you pay, get paid for if you use telehealth to deliver that service? That's what a lot of the telehealth policy before the pandemic was on the books. Any telehealth specific policy, the majority of it was related to reimbursement and coverage underneath whatever payer you're talking about, whether you're talking about Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial plans. It was, the policy was about the reimbursement, what's covered and what's paid for. You did have other policy areas that had some telehealth specific language to it, such as um, maybe uh, prescribing, especially with the contro prescribing of controlled substances, but other areas that impact the use of telehealth didn't really have a specific telehealth policy, but did impact the use of it, such as like licensing or privacy. Um, there's mention of it, maybe if, if you're lucky, you may see the state law mention like privacy in some way, but they would really refer back to, well, make sure you just abide by HIPAA or something like that. So you had all these areas where there needed to be changed in order to facilitate the use of telehealth, but then only some of them had specific telehealth policies. Others didn't, but they did impact the use of telehealth. And both on the state and federal levels, policymakers had to make changes in order to allow it to be used more widely to address the pandemic. So what were some of the federal policies? When you're talking about federal policies for telehealth, you're really talking about Medicare. There are other federal policies, again, with like prescribing of controlled substances, but the telehealth specific policies on the federal level, it's primarily around Medicare. And Medicare has two approaches to, to telehealth. So they have a, a bucket of policies that is called telehealth, which is very telehealth specific. It says the word telehealth in those policies. And it's controlled by what's in federal law. So these are like rules and limitations that are in federal statute. So CMS itself can only do so much. They need to have literally an act of Congress before they can make any like widespread changes. And the policies are extremely limited. It like dictates sort of like, you know, where telehealth can take place, who can be the provider providing the services, what are the services covered. And a lot of that is embedded in federal law. So it's a very limited type of policy. Actually, before COVID-19, Medicare had one of the most restrictive telehealth reimbursement policies out there when you compare it to state Medicaid programs and some commercial payers. Medicare also has another approach to when you provide services via telehealth technologies. And they call it's this other bucket that they call communications technology-based services. And this bucket uses telehealth technologies, uses all those modalities I described earlier of live video store and forward to provide services, but they don't view it as telehealth. They call it communication technology-based services. Now, how do they make the distinction? They make this distinction by saying, well, telehealth replaces an in-person visit. So um, you go in for an office consultation with your, your doctor, you go in like in person, you can do that via telehealth. That's a one-to-one -one replacement. These communications technology-based services, they're services you normally don't do in person. But since we've got the technology now, we can actually do these services and we want to cover them. So going back to my hypertension example of the, the person taking readings at home and transmitting them to their doctor, you typically wouldn't do that in person. Like somebody wouldn't go into their clinician's office several times a day to get a blood pressure reading, you know, and do that over a period of several days. So there's like not a one-to-one -one replacement for it. So they said like, so for these non-one-to-one replacements, we're going to call it communications technology-based services. Now, what's the difference to that? Well, because it's not called telehealth, because it's not a one-to-one -one replacement, CMS is saying, well, we're not held to those limitations that are in federal law on telehealth. So we can create whatever policies we want for this. And, and that's what they've done. I'm spending a little bit of time on this because during the pandemic, they were doing changes to both, mainly towards telehealth, but a little bit to the communication technology-based services. And I think it's gotten confused sometimes in people's heads that they're one thing, they're one thing underneath telehealth. And CMS, in their viewpoint, they're not. They treat them very differently. They have different policies. They have different fee schedules for them. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, how states treat them is a little bit murkier. Some states have kind of like rolled some of that into their telehealth or, or they already were doing some of those communications technology-based services before it even became a thing and were reimbursing for it. So it's gotten a little bit murkier on the, the state level side of things, but just wanted to make this distinction for folks. 
What does this mean for California though? As I said, Medicare had one of the most restrictive telehealth policies pre-COVID-19 out there. A lot of states, including California, were way more advanced than what we were seeing coming out of Medicare before the pandemic. Because of those restrictive policies in Medicare pre-pandemic, California basically did not qualify a lot of places for telehealth reimbursement from the Medicare program. Because there were geographical restrictions, it eliminated a lot of state, a lot of portions of California from, from being eligible. So that really limited the, the access of Californians if they had Medicare to utilizing telehealth. So the federal law, again, before the pandemic, really hadn't seen a significant update since the year 2000. So going back to my example of like, well, may have made sense, the policy may have made sense in 2000 what the technology was there, but we're two decades in, it, it probably needed to be updated. So, so Californians were really at a disadvantage as far as the Medicare program was concerned and using telehealth before the pandemic. Pandemic hits, Medicare and federal government has to scramble. They got to like really relax some of those limitations. So what did they do? So when you look at the reimbursement policies, there's usually four elements to it. And this is why I was saying that you'll see like common areas that both on the state and federal levels, they change their policy. And that's really around service location, the type of provider providing service and the modality. So you'll see a lot of reimbursement policy for telehealth structured with these four elements. They have like their limitations around something or they'll say like, you know, how far you can go with something. So for example, you might have a Medicaid program that says, we will only reimburse for a type of service, psychiatric services to treat somebody with a substance use disorder. Location, when the patient is located in a clinic setting. The modality, when it's being provided by live video on the provider, when it's being provided by a psychiatrist, that's our policy. So, so those are kind of like the basic building blocks of like a lot of reimbursement policies and why you see like a lot of, a lot of areas where they address like one or more of these particular elements. So Medicare, when the pandemic hit, they basically had to make adjustments to all of these because they were so limited in what they were doing. So they increased the amount of services that they would cover. They opened up the location. Um, Medicare is a little bit different. They have both geographic and site locations. So they said like you need to be in a certain type of geographical area they call rural and a certain type of site. But they opened that up for the pandemic. The modality and I did not touch upon this, they opened it up to allow audio only phone. And that's because we go back to one of those con issues that I talked about was the connectivity issue. It's not just for seniors, others might have issue with like connection and their only sort of way of like communication might be through audio only phone. Pre-pandemic, that wasn't regarded by a lot of jurisdictions to be underneath the umbrella of telehealth, but policymakers recognizing that that may be only means of communication some people have allowed that for some services. So CMS opened it up for audio only phone and provider opening up the list of like what providers can provide the services. Pre-pandemic Medicare only had like about nine types of providers like doctors, physician, uh, physicians, nurses, midwives are on there, <clears throat> dietitians, very limited list. They've opened it up the list too. Now, so far, they have not really made a lot of these temporary policies, and these are have been temporary policies permanent yet, because that is like what both federal and state policymakers are struggling with now is we're year into the pandemic. What are these temporary telehealth policies are we going to keep around? So what did the states do? So the states pre-pandemic, I said like a lot of them were a lot more advanced than what Medicare was doing, and that's true. So some of them, all of them were doing something with live video, saying in their Medicaid program will at least reimburse for acts, and it ranged. It could be very narrow to like something very expansive. The store and forward and remote patient monitoring modalities were not as popular, so there was less reimbursement available for that in the Medicaid programs, various state Medicaid programs. And that's important to note for the remote patient monitoring one, because if a state was going to allow the home to be where the patient could be when they're providing, when they're getting the telehealth services, it was usually because they allowed remote patient monitoring to happen. So you can see like before the pandemic, only about 21 states allowed that. That meant a lot of state Medicaid programs did not allow the home to be an eligible site, to be a place where the patient could be located for the telehealth interaction took place. So that meant that there had to be a lot of like temporary waivers to allow that to happen again when the pandemic hit. 
then states also have commercial payer laws. So commercial payer laws are basically telling what the health plans have to do around telehealth. And the laws ranged from states saying health plans, you can cover telehealth if you want to, all the way to a state saying health plan, you shall cover telehealth delivered services the same way you would have in person. <laughs> By the way, you will also pay them the same amount as you would have in person. And then all the other states kind of fall in between there. So that really dictated how much the state government or the governor could direct health plans during the pandemic on what they could do, what they were supposed to do with telehealth. Um, to, to a lot of health plans credits, they didn't wait around to be told. They just went ahead and did, did something and had some sort of telehealth policies. But the, the commercial payer laws, that did sort of help, I think, some states in like being more direct with health plans on what they could do with telehealth. What's going on in California? So in California, we have Medi-Cal. And California pre-pandemic actually had one of the most progressive, one of the broadest policies out there, way more advanced than what CMS and Medicare was doing as far as telehealth. So, and California had just updated their Medi-Cal policies before the pandemic hit. It was like updated in August of 2019. Pandemic hits in February, March, around that area, 2020. California, we did have to do some like adjustments, but for the most part, we had already made our adjustments, a lot of those adju necessary adjustments before the pandemic hit. So we were actually in a lot better positions than other states. So basically what Medi-Cal's policy was as far as telehealth was, we'll cover any service as long as like it can be covered and it's what we typically covered and it doesn't have some sort of in-person requirement or something that where you can't use the technology. Like you have to, it says like you have to touch the patient or something like that. So they said, we'll, we'll cover it. The modality, they said, well, we'll cover both store and forward and live video. And we're leaving it up to the provider to decide which one to use, which is great. It's not a dictated to them saying like, you can only do these services via these modalities. Location, Spanakal was like, oh, we don't, it's fine, whatever location the patient is in. And then the provider, they basically said like all eligible Medi-Cal providers, if they can provide the service and they, they can provide it over the modality, we're going to cover it. Now, if you were a federally qualified health center or rural health clinic, you did have limitations. But for the most part, it was pretty broad. It was like pretty expansive before going in. There is a consent requirement in California that you need to get oral or written consent before the telehealth interaction takes place. And then also before the pandemic, AB 744, which involved commercial payers was just passed and basically was one of those laws that said like, you're gonna pay the same amount <laughs> whether it was delivered in person or via telehealth. So one of the more sort of um, forward thinking, one of the more expansive commercial payer laws, although it would not have kicked in until 2021. So this was the situation of California going into the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, again, some adjustments had to be made to the Medi-Cal program. One of the biggest ones was allowing audio only phone because again, basically everybody before the pandemic did not consider audio only phone part of telehealth. But when the pandemic hit, recognition that a lot of people needed services and some people just didn't have access to broadband, audio only phone was the only option. So California did have to make that adjustment. Those limitations on the FQECs and RHCs, those were lifted to allow them to be able to use telehealth more expansively to during the pandemic. So the commercial plans were were pushed um, ahead of time because they had like the the timeline of like January 1st of 2021 to like be covering telehealth, give parity coverage for telehealth. They were pushed, that timetable was moved up for them basically and said like, you need to do this. And then some of the, the um, privacy laws were relaxed a little bit to allow other types of uh, platforms to be used more frequently like texting. Um, so there were certain changes that were made in California, again, but not like the sweeping changes that we saw with CMS and Medicare and not what other states had to do, mainly because California had like a fairly good, robust telehealth policy going into the pandemic. Other issues that arose, I talked about the connectivity, hence why we had to do audio only phone. So broadband has definitely become like a more significant issue, more talked about licensure because you had people sometimes stuck. So you had licensure become like even a more significant issue of, for discussion because you had people who were, who couldn't access their usual providers because they were stuck in another jurisdiction. Privacy and security, some of those had to be relaxed on the federal and on the state level in order to like help facilitate the use of telehealth. Not that telehealth couldn't met those privacy and security laws, but they were trying to allow people to stand up programs very quickly because there had to be that quick 
pivot to like start telehealth programs. And there were a lot of people who had to start and build telehealth programs at the beginning. So many people. And so in order to facilitate that happening quickly, you saw governments relax some of these privacy laws as well. And then we also ran into outdated forms and mechanism because you had, you know, people who never done telehealth before. So their forms hadn't been updated when they were submitting them to like Medi-Cal or to Medicare. And they were saying like, wait, they want us to put this information because I'm doing it via telehealth, but there's no slot on here for me to do that. So that was also an issue we encountered. And education of patients and providers. Before the pandemic, if you were not in healthcare, you most likely didn't really know that telehealth existed or what it was or be like, what's that term? What does it mean? You had patients getting a crash course in telehealth, like understanding what it is, hearing it for the first time, but it was still new to them. So there needs to be like that better education for the patients. A lot of times, for the most part, it fell to the providers to try to provide that. And for some of them, it was like a new arena for them to, to offer it. They may have been aware of the concept, but they've never done it before. So there was like, you know, this really educational issue between like for providers, but also for definitely for patients as well. Now, what's going forward now in like 2021? So I said policymakers, both on the state and federal level, are struggling with what to keep permanent. Here in California, there's been two routes in doing that, and that is administrative changes and legislative changes. There's been a couple of bills that have been introduced looking at keeping some of the temporary changes permanent, such as you know the more expansive allowances for federally qualified health centers to use telehealth. But there's also been administrative proposals. So. So the governor has some proposals in the, the budget and also the Department of Healthcare Services have also come out with their own set of proposals in like what they are suggesting keeping around. This is an overview of what some of those proposals are like what the landscape was pre-COVID, during COVID and some of their proposals. And we'll get a little more detail in the proposals. So basically their proposals from this is a combination of both what's in the trailer bill and like what DHCS has proposed. And I just put it underneath the general title of administrative. For live video, basically they were saying like there's going to be parity in managed care fee for service. So that means you would get paid the same amount. They're allowing providers, including those FQHCs and RHCs, to, to use like the live video more expansively. And also like lifting some of those FQHC limitations, such as like where the patient is located and also, you know, establishing that patient provider relationship if they're using live video. And then there are some other changes that I've made to like different programs as well too. Asynchronous and audio only, this is where things get different though. So I mentioned earlier that pre-COVID-19, the California policies was allowed to use asynchronous or live video. It was left up to the provider to decide how, which modality to use. In their proposals, they're gonna change that. They're gonna push asynchronous, that storm forward option and audio only into a different category along with remote patient monitoring. And it's gonna have its own policies, its own fee schedule, its own requirements and something called utilization management policies which is a term I had not heard before, but to me, it says limitation of how often you can do it. <laughs> I'm just guessing there was no definition for that term and I hadn't seen it before, but that's kind of my guess is what that means. And, and the reason for this and like separating out the live video and then like for all these other services is that saying that they're not the same. They're not the same as you would have in person and, asynchron and, and synchronous and live video. They're, so these other things, these other modalities that use, they're not the same as those. Now, where does that sound familiar? That sounds very, very similar to like what I went over at the beginning of this presentation in Medicare and like their different policies for telehealth and those communications technology-based services. So it sounds like they're trying to align a little bit with Medicare, which as a telehealth proponent for me, I, I'm a little wary of because as I said, Medicare had one of the most restrictive policies around telehealth going into the pandemic. And we had California who had one of the most progressive policies before the pandemic seemingly taking a step backwards now and aligning itself a little bit with like Medicare. So what's going on with that? Also FQHCs would not be able to use these other modalities as well. So you have them sort of like shortchanged on that. Before the pandemic, they were allowed to use some of these modalities, the store and forward modalities in a limited fashion. So that's being taken away from them. 
other proposed changes that they have on here. I mean, like I said, they're not all restrictive. One of the things is like lifting the site limitations for FQHCs and RECs, so they would be able to treat patients in the homes before the pandemic. They weren't allowed to do that. During the pandemic, they were temporarily allowed to do that. So that's something they'll keep around as well. And then like addressing um, telehealth and like network adequacy. This is just sort of like an overview of like some of the major changes that they're they're proposing and like you know how they line up with each other uh, pre and during the pandemic. But this is sort of a visual of like where all that falls. You have your pre COVID policies, you have your COVID policies that encompass and did more than those pre pre COVID policies, and then you have your proposals if they pass intact the way they've been proposed right now, taking a little bit from each and then adding some new stuff as well, which. If, if you look at it, I feel it does take us a little bit backwards from where we were before the pandemic. It's not that they aren't adding some new things and keeping some of the things changes that were made around temporarily, they are, but they're also taking stuff away that existed before the pan pandemic too. That is only if the proposals as they stand now are accepted and they have not been accepted yet. They have been not agreed, been agreed to yet. They have not been implemented yet, but that's what we've got right now, like the information we have right now. So that's it. That's the state that we're in right here in California. These are just some links to CCHP's uh, website. We have a newsletter, but we also are tracking what's going on at the federal level and the states, all the states. We track all 50 states in DC. So you can, if you're interested in what other states are doing too, you can check that out as well. And I think we've got time for questions. And I see there's one in the box. How has policy around COVID-19 screening apps like Simply Screen changed? I'm not familiar with Simply Screen, so I can't really, really speak to that one. But as far as the policies on apps, it's definitely during COVID become a little bit easier because they did do some relaxations of some of those privacy laws as well. So, and also allowing more modalities to be used. So with the usage of apps has become a little bit easier during COVID-19. The question is, will that stick around? Definitely if they were relaxation on privacy and security laws, um, my guess would be those would not stick around. Those would probably be some of the first things that get rolled back. But, but that is, I'm not familiar with that particular app, but that in general has been what's been happening with apps. Are you aware of any efforts by healthcare providers to support older adults in getting online and learning skills to use telemedicine? So it, that has been sort of like by provider, provider, entity to entity. There's been no sort of comprehensive sort of government effort in that. Um, Lord knows I've talked about it a lot with them. So I've been hoping to see something. So it has been sort of more um, provider, provider based or community, community based or organization, organizational based. Like some organizations have like made an effort if they are dealing with like a senior community as constituents to like try to help them with that. But it really has fallen towards the providers to like provide that information. And it, it varies. I talked about my parents being moved over to like telehealth. I'm not going to name them. They're underneath the big health system. They have an established telehealth program. The education for my parents on when they were searching them over telehealth was lousy. So it is, it's going to vary from system to system, provider to provider on how good that is. Now I've talked to other programs, other clinics who have just who were one of those that pivoted on a dime and set up a telehealth program. And they told me what they were doing on like education their patients, and it sounded great. My parents did not have like a really good experience with that. If I was not there acting as the intermediary and if I was not probably who I was with my experience, it probably would not have been a successful telehealth visit as it was. So it's gonna vary to vary and you know vary a lot. There are any other questions? I know that was a lot of information, so I apologize for that. And, um, you know, Martha, I'm happy if you want to share my PowerPoint with anyone, if they want a copy of it, that's totally fine with that. What defines a successful telehealth visit? Um, it's going to vary. So basically, a successful visit on the provider's end is that they got the information that they needed in order to like treat and help their patient. And on the patient's end, that they felt like the visit really addressed their needs and that they got the care that they needed for it. So it's going to depend on who you talk to. <laughs> and then if you talk to 
I don't mean to be sarcastic, but if you sometimes maybe talk to a policymaker, they would probably say like, you know, it, they show better outcomes for like having that telehealth visit, like good outcomes from it. Um, and also maybe, you know, even saying like, was there like a savings of doing that? And the savings could mean not necessarily that, you know, they paid less for a telehealth visit, but that maybe the telehealth visit um, prevented like a more serious case. Like I talked about like hatching some of those chronic conditions before, you know, they develop into like an emergency visit, emergency room visit. Can you address this pandemic and how to approach auth authentication and health tech? I'm not sure I understand that question. Can you address the pandemic and how to approach authentication? Education in health tech. Are you asking about um, how to make sure that who you're talking to is who you think they are? And if that person would like to raise their hand, we can take them off. We can unmute them so that they can answer their question, ask their question live. So let's see. That is. It's from Luke Daling. You did follow up. My firm had some hackers pretending to be CDPH, and I was working at a clinical laboratory. Let me scroll down. Is there more information here? Oh, okay. So yes, you are asking for. Well, um, I'm not sure for your situation, but what like providers are doing when they're talking with patients is one, they may know the patient already because they've like seen them in person. So they knew the, who they're talking to. So that could, that's kind of eliminates that situation. But if they're a new patient for that, there's like different ways that I've heard providers do that. They have literally asked for, can you please hold up your driver's license to the camera for me to like check that out? Or they have, um, you know, maybe match them up with like, you know, they get the information beforehand and like, you know, they talk to like their insurance company and they like verify the information with the insurance company. The most common one I've heard of is sort of like, hold up your driver's license to the camera so I can check your picture with you and make sure you are who you, you say you are. But a lot of times, especially like during the pandemic, it, they may have already had that patient provider relationship established. So they knew who they were talking to because, you know, that was a patient that they've seen before and that has come in person. Uh, where can we learn more about the push towards the Medicare model? So you can like sign up for CCHP's newsletter because we do, we do like focus in on this. Um, the Cal California Telehealth Policy Coalition, I mentioned them, you could be a member of that because we are tracking that. And also the uh, coalition is doing our own webinar talking about these proposals um, on um, March 30th. I can send, if anybody's interested, you can email me or or I can send the information to Martha and she can like circulate it for people who are interested in joining that webinar. It's free. It's gonna be on the 30th. It starts at noon, it's one hour. And we're gonna be hearing from different, different groups to see how like these proposals might impact them. We're hearing from the California Primary Care Association, Marriage and Family Therapists, um, Inland Empire Health Plan, and the Children's Partnership. And the panel will be moderated by AARP California. Um, Diana had her hand raised. Uh, do you know any uh, pending Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you do you know any pending legislation at the uh, national level around uh, telehealth and older adults? Oh, okay. So there's legislation in Belfin, California, and on the national level, and I didn't really go over uh, any of those. So the legislation on the federal level, yes, there's like pending legislation and probably more legislation that's going to be introduced to that impacts Medicare. This is my feeling on this. Telehealth legislation, specific bills on the federal level regarding telehealth never really make it through. They have been introduced multiple times over the years and they rarely make it through. They just kind of sit and languish in committee, not because they're bad bills, but there's just other stuff going on in Congress that they're dealing with and these bills just kind of like sit there and die. What has happened though in the past is that there have been elements of some of these bills that have been plucked out and put into larger bills, such as an Appropriations Act, 
and or a budget bill. So they've like put that in there and you've had some policy changes made over the last couple of years, small ones, but you know, they, they're actual law changes um, put into these larger bills. What's going on now? And this is, I, this is not any insider track that I'm having. This is just my experience and like me tea leave reading here. I do not think there is going to be another major piece of legislation related to telehealth to make a permanent change. If they were going to do that, they would have done that with the, and I'm going to get a little bit in the weeds, but there was a bill passed called the Consolidated Appropriations Act. It was like the previous COVID bill before the reconciliation bill that just passed. This was passed back in December of 2020. I had expected if they were going to make any of these Medicare federal changes permanent, it would have been in that bill. There was nothing in that bill. There were other telehealth stuff, but nothing with these temporary changes. Over the last couple of months, I've been getting the sense of hesitation from policymakers from making that commitment of making a, a, a permanent change. And then just recently, there's this group called MedPAC and they advise Congress on like what to do with like Medicare. They, they've always had kind of like a little bit of a bias towards telehealth, I think. But basically they recommended like keeping the temporary changes around for like a year or two to get more data. I think if anything's gonna happen is that we're gonna get into this limbo stage of like, we'll keep the temporary changes around just so we can get more data so we can make an informed policy change. I think that's what's going to happen as opposed to like a bill saying like, no, we want to make this permanent and change X, Y, and Z. That still may happen. This is just the sense that I'm getting. And that may also happen. That may also be replicated on the state level too, because I'm wondering if that's going to be, they're going to follow the federal lead if the feds do that. If like states start following the federal lead, but like, well, we'll keep some of this temporary stuff around for like a year or two, just to get more data and information before we make a decision. That's just all my guess. Like I said, nobody's talked to me. I don't have an inside track. Biden administration's not calling me and saying like, this is what we're, we're proposing. That's just sort of me sort of tea leave, tea leave reading and I can be totally wrong. I think that's it, May. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Well, May, thank you so much. I hope that all of the uh, changes and proposals that you mentioned are accepted and implemented um, you know, soon post COVID, right? So thank you very much for all that information. And as you mentioned, we will have the uh, PowerPoint available on our website, um, the Seniors Agenda website. And I can also email that as well to the group. Thank so thank announcement. You for having me. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much, May. So just some quick announcements. Our first announcement is, um, let's see. Oh. Parks and Recreation, San Jose Parks and Recreation is hosting a, um, a virtual trip, which is really cool. This Cantor Arts Center, March 30th at one o'clock. So you can go ahead and register on the website um, that's listed here, sanjoseregistration.com. Uh, next announcement is uh, the, the programs that Gardner is hosting. We have the peer in-home program and also the uh, storytelling program. Go ahead and go to Gardner, GardnerHealthServices.org for more information. We have another slide. Uh, Onlock. We have our Onlock is hosting a virtual session on March 20th from 11 to 12 and the 24th from 2 to 3. These sessions will highlight services that are provided through their PACE program. So you can go ahead and get additional information by uh, emailing info at Onlock or RSVPing to this number. And Older Americans Month, we mentioned before, save the date, Thursday, May 6th. Um, we will have Doug McConnell hosting this. So if you want additional information, you can go ahead and email Senior Center at SunnyvilleCalifornia.gov or um, just look for something in our newsletter coming up as well. And then vaccine information. I think the most important part for this um, is the sccfreevax.org. Go to that website and you can get information regarding the latest news, facts, um, anything in regards to vaccines in our area. And lastly, we encourage you to attend our final um, lecture in this series on the 25th of March, which is next Thursday. That one starts at one 
And that one's a little bit longer, but we will be having uh, Cami Griffith from the Community Tech Network. She'll be discussing um, programming in the time of COVID-19. So just like you did for these, please go to the Eventbrite page and search Seniors Agenda to register. And thank you to May. Thank you so much for all of the information that you provided. Um, that was fantastic. And we will all have this information available on our website. Um, PowerPoint questions, anything that you might have, you can always email Seniors Agenda. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much for attending.